This is Coda Radio, episode 318 for July 16th, 2018. Hi everyone and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and its related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, Digital Ocean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris and join us every single week like the monk living down in Florida he is. Why it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello Mike! Um, um, oranges and alligators, um. Oh, are you getting in the zone? Is that what you're doing right there? You're, you're, you're I am a level eight. Zone? Uh, you, you know, this is actually not funny. There is a huge Scientology, like, base near where I live. Really? Really? It's a bit scary. Yeah. Have you thought about going in there? You know, I think if you want to go in there and find out, you have to go in with two other people. The sheriff has for illegal child labor, though. Oh really? Oh yeah, that no. was a big scandal some time ago. Oh, yeah, they, no. they they uh, the deputies Man. were not thrilled. You know, but it's such a good way to save money. You know, it's such a good way. Listen, to, you know, we call them interns at the Mad Bot, or uh, I call them outsource, and then that's their problem. I just don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, children are my future workforce. What can I say? <laughs> but if you don't pay them at all, you have to pay payroll tax. I don't think so. <laughs> I feed them. I feed them. Uh, well, Mr. Wow. Dominic, we've gathered together on a day when GitHub's down, which is always one of my favorite days to record Coda Radio because everybody is just a little on edge. Uh, let me refresh their status page here, status.github.com. The site is stable, and they're continuing to monitor. So it looks like they actually just got it up um, two minutes before we started recording the show. So that's pretty good. Phew. Code Journal is safe. Oh, oh no. Code Journal's been gone for a couple of years now. I know. And I know. this is one of those days where I'm like, your $5 Thank God. would not have been worth it. <laughs> no. Well, we have a good show today. Uh, uh, you've destroyed some things. I'm obsessing over some things. We're going to talk a little PyCharm and Python's uh, um, benevolent dictator stepping down, as well as some hardware updates. And then a, 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 I don't know how to describe this service we're about to talk about, but a service you're familiar with was sold around for a little bit and now is going independent again. And uh, we'll talk about all the ins and outs and our perspectives on that. Right. So why don't we start with you destroying things? Because that's what I want to start with. <laughs> you, right. you are uh, having adventures in hardware and it ends with things being destroyed. And this I have to know about. <laughs> okay. I am. Oh, goodness. I have this antique wooden desk in my home office. Okay. That I'm going. It's a beautiful desk, but it's like ergonomically just painful to sit out for 10 hours a day so i have on order a standing desk for my home office because i gave the one that was oh in the congratulations office. good for Thank you. you but like it's important that you know this is a solid wood antique desk we're talking about here okay not okay. some flimsy <laughs> staples like i used my pinky to flip that across the room so there was a cable that was doing no one any harm and i decided that it needed to be moved was it just bugging you a little bit? It was just bugging me. It was like poking out there like a turtle. So I went to get it. Lost my balance because that's what you do when you're leaning over a giant wooden <laughs> desk trying to. And thought I was grabbing the back of the desk. That okay. was not the case. I ended up grabbing the back of my Optiplex, my Dell Optiplex. Um, and as I fell, my hand gripped and I s snapped the little uh, nodes inside of the... So if you don't know, Dell desktops have these like puck. It looks almost like a small hockey puck, Chris, that has a wire and two little copper nodes that go back for the Wi-Fi adapter. Okay. Um, so I snapped some of those internal nodes. Mm. So for days, I've been unable to use my Dell. <laughs> Oh, then no. this morning I get the grand idea instead of just like ordering a Wi-Fi card on Amazon for like 40 bucks to take a pair of pliers, open up the computer and painstakingly turn back the pins. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, because you're getting to that point now. And sure enough, it worked. Oh, really? Oh, congratulations. I, I, I did a speed test. Right before, I did a couple during the day. I've been getting anywhere from 60 to 80 megabits a second. 
I have a similar, uh, not falling down story, but nice fix. That's a good one. I had a Dell wireless card that was in my laptop, an XPS 13 that I got, and it was like a Broadcom. And it just wasn't, it wasn't that I couldn't use it with Linux at the time. It was that I had to go through this rigmarole to load a firmware. And there was this whole thing about loading Windows. Anyways, uh, so I decided, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to buy an Intel wireless card off of Amazon, pop the a bottom of this XPS 13 off and uh, pop out the Wi-Fi card and put in the Intel card. What's the big deal, right? So I do just that. I order the card. I take the bottom of the XPS 13 off. And uh, sure enough, if when I'm removing the original wireless card, if I don't break the cord, like the little connector mm. that, you know, because it has like this little copper pu- punch down connector and I break the cord right off and uh, immediately ruin the computer's ability to have Wi-Fi uh, before I even got the card out. And I'm like, oh, jeez. And so I thought about it for a couple of days. I'm like, how am I going to fix that? Because I, I didn't have any soldering tools at the time. I do now, but I didn't then. And I went and got a conductive glue. Put the thing back nice. together, the wire to the metal with conductive glue, and it actually worked. And the it's been like that years now. I'm I'm probably three, four years. I don't know how long I've had that XPS 13, but it was it was like the first day I got it, I broke it. And now I've been using it like that for years. So you know what? You probably have you probably you probably nailed it. I I you know have what? gotten it's... Go ahead. I was just saying I've gotten out of a few situations by just trying to like pin push pins back into the right place. Yeah, it just like worked, <laughs> right? Like although it makes me think about like how shoddy these crappy desktop Wi Fi cards actually are. Because all it is yeah, is yeah. two copper nodes touching each other. Yep. And that's how that's a good the point whole too. thing works. Yeah, it's the yep. antenna connector cheese bacon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Cheese Bacon in the chat room over at irc.geekshed.net. So I, every now and then, go through these phases where, and it's usually something technical, it's almost always something that runs on Linux that sort of grabs my interest, and then I just sort of go all in on the research, and I, you know, I read all of the things, and I watch all of the videos, and try to find, like, the communities where those people sort of aggregate and try to, like, just read the things they're discussing about, and I just get all proper kinds of obsessed. And um, it's totally happened to me while well, I'm I'm down in Texas. I'm down here for a couple more days because um, Linux Academy has asked us to give me and Angela give a talk at uh, their summit they're having down here. And the first part of the week they're having one with their trainers and their their what they call um, training architects. And then the second half of the week, which I'll be here for part of, is um, for like their leadership, like their directors and their VPs. Uh, and about community and about giving back upstream and about some of the stuff that they're getting ready to start open sourcing. So they, you know, are picking our brain and about building community and all this kind of stuff. And so while I'm down here, I've been down here since uh, uh, I've been down here for a, a week and change. Uh, I got down here two Saturdays ago, just a couple of days after the fourth. Actually, I left Seattle. So the weekend after the fourth, I've been in Seattle or I mean, I've been in Texas. And while I got when I got here, I ordered myself a a car off of Turo T U R O or something like that. It's a it's Airbnb for cars. So it's a, it's I call it cucking for cars. It's just you take somebody else's car for a while, and uh, it, you you get insured through the app. Like they they partner with Loop Liberty Mutual Mutual or whatever it is, and you you browse cars like you would browse houses on Airbnb, and you pick one, and then they bring it to you, and they drop it off, and they take an Uber out. They, they Uber out of there and they leave you their car. Well, I'm flipping through all of them and there's everything on there from totally tricked out trucks to Teslas and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, I don't really need anything that fancy. And <clears throat> I heard a lot of people recently talking about the Volkswagen GTIs. And I thought, well, what do I care? It's 60, $69 a day. It's the cheapest car on here. Uh, and, you know, I kind of had like a bad impression of Volkswagen. So I was like, yeah, I'll just, you know, maybe I'll challenge my assumptions a little bit. So I ended up getting this car. Totally now obsessed with this car. Love this car. It's such a fun car. Totally in that research phase. Almost to that point where it's starting to like intrude on my work. I haven't quite crossed that threshold yet. Uh, but it's the first time it's ever happened with a car. Like it's always been more like things on the computer or gadgets. It's never really been a vehicle before. Although there's a lot of gadgets in this vehicle, including my first chance to play w- around with uh, CarPlay, which has been pretty good. Finally, after all these years, I've never been in a car that had CarPlay before. Uh, and so that's been really interesting. Plus all the little hidden things they have in this car and uh, it, all of all of the just all the new technologies that have been in cars since I've gotten a new vehicle. It's really, really something. 
I may end up with a new vehicle after a while, but it's it's fascinating researching this and how much is about like the the entertainment system and how it works and the speed of it. Like the reviews really focus on like touchscreen performance. Now they're really reviewed like gadgets. It's it's really something to get into this again after years of not really caring about cars. You know what I mean? Like getting obsessed like that. It's a strange thing. Now, are you going to buy a BMW or a Mercedes and like? You know, know. The, the last time I was down here, I turroed a Mercedes because I was like, well, if you're going to mm. get a car, you know, right, get right, a right. car. And I figured it's going to have, you know, Mercedes will probably have great air conditioning. And it's 102 today. So great air conditioning is kind of mandatory. Uh, this GTI, this Golf GTI is 10 times more fun to drive than that Mercedes was. Really? Uh, really? Oh, it's, it is, it is the funnest car I've ever driven. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous, ridiculously good handling, super fast. Cause it's really tiny and light and it's got a 220 horsepower engine in it, plus a turbo. <laughs> so it can really haul. Uh, in fact, if anybody out there in the audience has a newer, like a, a platform seven an MK seven or, or around that area, around that genre, whatever of golf, let me know how, how, what kind of troubles you've had. Talk me out of it. Or maybe talk me into it, coder.show slash contact or at Chris LAS on Twitter. I am kind of thinking about when I get back to Washington trading in the truck. Because it also gets like 35, 33 what? miles to the gallon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I never would have thought I'd hear this out of you. Ever. <laughs> well, you know, you know. I gotta I gotta you know, I gotta give it to the Germans. They know how to build a car, it turns out. Turns out. So, anyways, what do you say we get into some feedback? Let's do it. Do, it's a good thing nothing emails. happened this week. Yeah. I know. Nothing that we need to talk about. But one bit of follow-up from Harold. He writes in. He says, hey, guys, in reference to that kid in the last episode that wanted to learn Python, I know it's something that you're all probably aware of. But uh, sometimes if kids get bored, it might be worth to have them jump into something like PyCharm CE. Additionally, Coursera has specializations, and it starts slower, and it helps you ease into it. The later courses would then challenge him, and it's just at Coursera.org slash learn slash Python. Uh, it can be done for free without any certification or paid paying to get the certs. I breezed through it since I've been doing development for years now, and I worked with people who've never programmed at all, and they were able to pick it up relatively easily. So check it out. Python Charm, CE, and the Coursera documentation, coursera.org slash learn slash Python, which is a good one. You know, but yeah. really, while we're talking about Python, why don't we jump into the big elephant in the room this week? Python's benevolent dictator for life has had enough. He's resigned. And he's he's doing it in a way that's kind of unusual. It's it's sort of a have at it. Come up with your own governance now. I'm out. I'll be around. I'll mentor people. I'm still going to be participating in the community. I'm not running the show anymore. And you guys need to figure out, are you going to do a federation? <laughs> are you going to do a democracy? Are you going to get Cling a new empire. dictator? Yeah. Isn't that a fascinating thing? And this, this is like a 28-year-old project, right? I mean, isn't it Python? How long has Python been around? I think it's nearly it's like – I think it's like – 245 years or something like that. So at first, so let's say, I think the first launch was in 1990. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, the, so you, you look at the age of this project. This is, this is a massive disruption to have something like this happen. Like the, I don't, how does a project even bounce back after something like this? Like it's, that's, it seems like it's going to cause total chaos. What do you think? I don't think it's going to be that bad. I mean, you know, he did stick it out, and I think you mentioned this on the Linux, Ac- Linux Action News for the B- PEP 57, I believe it was called, the yeah. new feature in Python. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big Python guy, so I don't know the details about it. Um, also, my understanding of how the Python community was working in effect is that it was a, he was, quote, dictator for life, but the, there was, like, councils and people voted on things and argued yeah. things and has, had a mail list. And with didn't proposals. consult him a Hadn't really been right. consulting him a ton for a while. So I think it's more making real, making formal what was already in reality true. Is, is my take on it, which again, I'm someone super removed from the whole Python thing, right? So You know, that's an interesting take because you could see the logical progression of a project, you know, when, when it's smaller and younger um, and un- even unproven, <clears throat> the role of a benevolent dictator is so much more critical. But as a project becomes sort of an open source staple and it really kind of grows and expands into, I mean, there's there's very few projects that have <clears throat> the prestige and presence and mindshare that Python has. And when you get to that scale, 
you can't help but develop a level of complexity because of the size of the project and the people inside that project's organization becomes. And you have to wonder if it's not just natural in that type of environment for that benevolent dictator role to become less and less viable and therefore less and less relevant because there's just so many interests. Now, one of the things for this feature that they were they, they really fought about was like syntax stuff, like just the like, what should it, what should it be? Should it be an equal sign? Like just this Wait massive. Dev nerds care a lot about syntax. What? <laughs> I know. And yeah. so what ends up happening, right, is you really kind of have a position that by the very nature of the structure of the project. Now it's kind of irrelevant the dictator position, but yet it still is the focal point of all of the blame. And when the fights get really nasty, it's up to the dictator to make the call. Who then has to then take the heat from whatever side didn't like that call. Like, there's really very little upside to that position anymore, it seems to me. Maybe it's always doomed. Well, there's, there's also the point of, like, Python, especially with a lot of the ML and data science stuff, has become a lot bigger. Uh, frankly, it's really at the height of its uh, power right now, right, in terms of popularity and, and developer mindshare. I, I kind of think it's so much... You know, I think it doesn't matter, right? Like, having a dictator for life... There are some things you just can't do anyway. Like there's a whole Python 2, Python. Remember when that was a big thing? Python 2, Python yeah. 3. And I know from people who develop Python that it's still kind of a problem. But the reality is if you start a new project, you probably start on Python 3. Right? And if you're maintaining Python 2, you, you, you may still be maintaining that until you die. Right. You know, Token Ring makes a good point in the chat room. He says the project kind of knew this was coming. So they were they were braced for it. Now, I ask you this. Is this maybe how you fix a really fractured community is you have a sacrifice. Um, somebody falls on their sword. Somebody makes the hard decision, gets that project past this difficult phase, gets them on the other side of the storm and then commits Harry Carey. Like it just is the only way to then generate consensus within the project is, Oh, well it was all that guy. He was a dick. And now that so he's gone, let's all work together. Right. Are you saying a young Jewish boy should be tortured for several hours, beaten and then crucified? I mean, you've just described Jesus. <laughs> Python Jesus. That's that's exactly what you just described. I'll yeah, take all but, your sins, all your hatred. Like yes, exactly. Maybe oh, that's I'm just going to point you to DHH, and that is not what's happening on the Ruby side. I'll tell you what else is. Yeah, I was just going to say it's not a sustainable model, is it? It's not something you can pull off very often, and it requires the ultimate sacrifice. No, to do I, it. I'm actually arguing that Python. I mean, this is one of my things. Right, years ago, I had a choice: Python or Ruby for like scripting language of choice, and I chose Ruby. And Ruby's great. I Tons of Ruby, it's great for web applications, but for all this like ML kind of stuff, yeah, the support for Python is just incredible. The support for Ruby, that's why I do it in F sharp, hmm. right? It, it's it, it's a little, it's interesting how at one point I felt they were both peers, and it did seem like Ruby was going to win because of Rails, but Python just kind of found its niche, um, and that niche is things that are hard and aren't just making some hipster web application. Please don't email the show. <laughs> um, Ruby thanks. <clears throat> there's one other Unless thing about this. Unless you have a gold MacBook, then you can email. Go ahead. <laughs> um, there's one other thing about this that I kind of wanted to pick your brain about is because um, I feel like we've witnessed this now a few times and I, I have no position on code of conducts. Um, in fact, I, they really, I think when done right, they're just, they make sense all around. But Python has a community code of conduct that basically prohibited this level of vitriol in their conversations. And I find it interesting that when the, when the, when the fights get really intense, when the debate really heats up, the code, of the, the code of conduct, or at least large portions of it, I should say, to be fair, just go out the window. Like the code of conduct doesn't even exist during some of these conversations. And it feels like that it, like if we're all going to buy off on this mechanism, then it you can't just use it to silence some speech. Like it has to be unilaterally applied. And then you really have to ask, well, what do we want in this code of conduct and what do we not want in this code of conduct? And I'm curious to know what you think. It really seems to have played very little role in tamping down the vitriol. Like it seems like it just went out the window. Uh, and what does that tell us about code of conducts? I mean, that's like a huge conversation, right? Um I, d I will point you just to another very popular open source project called this weird thing called Linux mm. that supposedly has some sort of rules, but then the guy who founded it sometimes will say F you to a vendor he doesn't like. 
So I, I think when you have a dictatorship, code of conducts, I mean, we all went to school, right? We all remember history. Then there are laws. And if you're in charge, you just don't listen to them. I mean, that's the way it goes. Um, I, I don't, again, I was not part of the Python open source project. I have no direct involvement. I did not get the impression that like the Python was like a super toxic environment, the Python developer group. I think people who are passionate, such as, I mean, frankly, you, right, and me, we were both guilty of this sometimes, can tend to get a little aggressive on things we care about. I don't, and, and, and frankly, I, I think it's a little unfair to, I guess, single out Python. I mean, if you... If, okay, so like the Ruby project, right? Let's let's take let's take the Rails project. They make an effort to be super PC, snowflake friendly. Again, don't email the show. Um, which I actually find incredibly annoying because adding four extra paragraphs to tell you that something's a huge memory leak, <laughs> it, it just totally turns me off, right? So I, I'm like, I don't bother with it. Um, but then again, you certainly don't want people doing things like someone asks you a legitimate but perhaps naive question, right? Which, which of course, happens all the time. Uh, you don't want people just slapping them down. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and you don't want prejudice, right? You, you obviously don't want racism, misogyny, and all that, homophobia. All yeah. that. You don't want any of that stuff. But I don't know. Like, I, I, it's, weird. it's weird being someone who writes a lot of Ruby code or in the... I write much less now than I used to, but used to write a lot of Ruby code and was kind of involved in that community and seeing how like I was kind of the odd man out when I used to go to Ruby conferences. I was like the most, you know, not PC person there. Right. And sometimes I'd have to be a little, little careful it, it, where if I go to like Linux events, I'm like the most snowflakey guy around. So I don't know. I, maybe I wouldn't even like single out Python. I would say that like it's. So I, I almost think of like open source projects like private clubs. Different clubs have different rules, right? And, and if if this club is not something you want to be involved with for whatever reason, then don't go. But I I don't think it's fair to say that Python was particularly bad. Um, I mean, other projects have certainly done horrible things, right? Uh, Chris, you remember that conference from a few years ago where like they were just like lewd on stage and a bunch of women just like walked out. Like there, mm. there, there's certainly such a thing as going too far. But I, I think the Python, from my indirect knowledge of it, was not didn't have those kinds of prejudicial problems. It had it's just like just like it's just more ways, like the, getting angry and aggressive. It's like the Linux mailing list, right? Like if you ever read that, it's you got a lot of strong personalities. Um, yeah. You know, if you were, the, the, I remember watching videos of a uh, Lenart Pottering in the middle of somebody's the presentation. If you don't know Lenart, he did a bunch of open source oh, yeah. stuff. System right? He jumps Pulse on stage audio. and just rips the guy apart for being wrong, right? Like, to me, that's what the open source community kind of is, but it's not personal. It's like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's no one's compared. Right. Well, no one's compelling you to like contribute to the Python project, and and frankly, there are alternatives. And if I would not, I don't know. I guess I don't see this issue. I, I don't think it's a real issue. I think there okay. are other projects. Curious. Yeah, I think there are projects that probably could use some more discipline that are like bad in this department. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would not think of Python as one of them. Yeah, that I don't want to name you know, names on the projects. Yeah. In the resignation letter, he calls it out and says, "What's the point of having this if you guys aren't go review it? And if you if you if you don't like it, leave." <laughs> and I thought that was interesting, but we'll link well, to in that. In a lot of ways, it, I mean, if if you are if you have a project with someone who's a dictator for life, right? Yeah, that is a private club. You want to be in my club? Fabulous. You have to follow my indentation, right? There's all the technical rules. You have to do pull requests the way I want them, and you also have to behave in a way that I think is good. Like for me, if I when I open source things, if you want to put rainbow ponies in your code, I'm cool with that. <laughs> I'm not cool with you putting like uh, you know the wrong type of indentation. So there's <laughs> don't joke different about rules that. for different people. It's just the way it is. <laughs> uh, one just really quick uh, mention because we were just talking about machine learning. Uh, Google has launched a, a something called Seedbank, and it's home to a bunch of machine learning templates. Uh, it's 
It's kind of neat. It's being shared by the TensorFlow team today, and it's an online collection of various projects from Google named Seeds that showcase machine learning various uses and its capabilities. One key aspect aspect to SeedBank is how all of the examples run right in your browser with no setup required. Do 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 do. Yep, and then Wait, afterwards do we, do we you know? can edit. Go ahead. I was just going to say afterwards you can edit and save it to your Google Drive. But what do we know? Is, right is, now? is there any uh, of, my, of my new favorite toy WebAssembly going on back there? Maybe? Do we know that? I wonder. You know, there's no call mm. out to WebAssembly. But, hmm. It's interesting because it says we'll, we'll follow it, allows, up on that. it allows code to run directly in the browser with the company providing the GPU backend. So my thinking is oh. it's not. WebAssembly in the browser because I think it's so server-based they're, running, they're, they're running it on a server and they're just sending yeah. you back the output. Uh, well, yeah. that's disappointing. But That okay. would be so cool, though. That is a, that's a great use for WebAssembly. You heard it here uh, first. WebAssembly is going to take over the world, just like I said Xamarin was going to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we do have more big things to get into this week, so let's take a moment and thank DigitalOcean, do.co slash coder. Coder, no S, and that'll get you a $100 credit over DigitalOcean when you sign up with a new account. DigitalOcean is really fast, great infrastructure that you can deploy in under 55 seconds. Enterprise-grade SSDs for every level of system. 40 gigabit connections coming into the hypervisor. Industry-leading performance to price, predictable costs and billing, and optimized droplets depending on what you need. I'll give you an example. My favorite system is three cents an hour. I get two CPUs, 80 gigabytes of SSD built in, three terabytes of transfer, four gigabytes of RAM. It's brilliant. But every now and then I've got a rig that's just going to be grinding out the CPU tasks. That's where their optimized droplets come in. You can access powerful CPUs with consistent, reliable performance. It's make, like, for example, for me, encoding video. But you may be doing something else as well. And they have flexible droplets. Keep this in mind. These are new mix and match plans where you can deploy different resources depending on what your application needs. they got cloud firewalls, monitoring and alerting. A beautiful dashboard. A dashboard for days, as some put it. And then a really clean, easy-to-use API that's well-documented. And they have great documentation for all other kinds of things you might want to deploy on your droplet. An entire application you can deploy, like, say, GitLab, as an example. One-click deployment of GitLab. One-click deployment of WordPress. One-click deployment of Ghosts. And many, 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 many more. Or you can just deploy a base system and build on top of that. With a 99.99% uptime, you know you're going to be feeling good when it's in production. You're not going to worry about it it's being down like uh, certain services were this morning. <clears throat> Dio. Dot co slash coder. Go there, check it out, and see what I've been talking about with that dashboard. It's unbelievable the power they managed to put in an easy-to-use interface. Dio.co slash coder. All right, Mr. Dominic, the other big elephant. We're getting we're just we're uh, we're out elephant hunting. I don't even not even. Uh, we uh, have a couple of big elephants in the room though that we do want to talk about. And the other one is the kinda update to the new MacBook Pro. Uh, and it's looking like it's primarily a speed improvement with some possible modifications to the keyboard. Lots of lots and lots of videos online and audio clips online of people typing on the new MacBook keyboards to sh- to like re- to show the difference in sound. Is this the update you've been waiting for? I mean, the biggest thing we've been critical about was the limit of 16 gigs of RAM, and now this brings in 32 gigs of RAM. We had people instantly tweeting us over the week asking us what we thought about this because this is something we've talked about here. What do you think? Is this enough? Okay, so. I'm going to start positive just so that when I swing the hammer, it will be that much sweeter. I mean, what? Yes. A yes, right? Like the processor upgrade to the, I believe it's an i9 with six cores. That is exactly what you need. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm losing my mind, Chris. The 32 gigabytes of RAM, exactly yeah. what we need. Mm hmm. The SSD pricing is, is is a little off, maybe. Ooh. Well, I mean, <laughs> did you did you play is. with that configurator? <laughs> oh man. Well, so yeah, when you go to four terabytes, it adds like uh, is it t- over two thousand dollars to the cost of the machine? Yeah, it's, it, you you can spend like half the computer on storage. Now yeah. the keyboard. Now, Chris, can, can I play you some audio? I this is live of what a keyboard should sound like. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Ah, yeah. yeah. Tactile, yeah. sexy, yes. 
That's nice. So I've listened to these videos too. I'm curious, what is your take on this, this, dare we call it, keyboard gate? Well, they got themselves a real pickle here, don't they? Um, right, because they, they they're can't currently, admit it. Yeah, they can't. They're getting sued. So that's a particular challenge. So in in press coverage, they were specifically asked by press, is this more than just a quieter keyboard? Are there other changes here? We're talking about how it's quiet. We've made it quieter. Well, they did that by installing a condom under the keys, by putting a diaper down there. And what it but is wait, is... Wait, wait, wait. It is a condom with a big hole right in the center. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's it does make them quieter, but it also helps block out some of the dust. So it's like a band aid. So this is their third take on this keyboard now, and I guess the the message here is this is the keyboard you're gonna get with this generation, you know, this configuration of MacBook. Um, I actually, you know, I have a 2016 Touch Bar, the first Touch Bar. When my when my old like 2012 2013 crapped out on me, I got this one so I could edit in Final Cut. Now, <clears throat> on this trip, I've brought two laptops with me, and I have the XPS 13, and I have the MacBook Pro. And I got to say, it's, you know, it is really nice to have a good amount of power in a, in a portable laptop. The, the MacBook Pro is just heads and shoulders, just way beyond faster than the XPS 13, as to be expected. So I, you know, on this trip, I've been like, you know what, I see a place for this. I, I do understand why people like this machine, especially if you can now put 32 gigs of RAM in it. But the thing is so damn uncomfortable to type on. It literally hurts my hands. I've never had a problem yes. with the sound. I've never had a key go out on me. Um, I'm sure. Oh, no, dude. But uh, I just, my fingers hurt after typing on it for a while. So I'm a little disappointed that they didn't address that because I think they should have the best keyboards. I think that should be something Apple should should really own. And it's a little disappointing. But... Aside from that, I think this is a pretty solid update. Like you said, six cores is pretty great, 32 gigs of RAM. A Radeon Pro uh, 560X, all right, I'll take that. Up to four terabytes if you've got the money is nice. Uh, but the other big thing in this is the T2 chip. The T2 chip is the same I.O. controller they have in the iMac Pro. And that's how they're getting the four terabytes of storage, is they're actually using two SSDs. Yes, and then they're using yes. that T2 chip to do basically, essentially, what is a RAID 0. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's really interesting because looking at the benchmarks for the disk on this thing, it's it's unbelievably fast. So like the XPS 13 with an MVNE drive can bench around 300 megabytes a second read and write in that area. And that's pretty, pretty comparable to modern laptops. Uh, there, there's some benchmarks that you can find online that show this. You know, three, four hundred megabytes a second is pretty average. It's pretty good, too. You know, not too bad for laptops. Um, the MacBook Pro 15-inch, the new update, is benchmarking around 2.2 gigs a second transfer rate. 2.2 gigs a second. And uh, in some cases, it's like up to 2.4 gigs a second. That's mental on a laptop. And the only way they're getting there is by doing some sort of crazy-ass raid. Um, we'll, we'll see how that works long-term. But, uh, damn, that's... That's pretty nice. No, yeah, there's, um, so there's some. Go ahead. That's a good upgrade there. You know what I mean? Like, and the screen now has is yeah, it's kind of the same crap screen, but now it's got True Tone, so that's something. Um, the screen though is really kind of getting a little. I, in my opinion, their screen's getting a little out of date. Um, but the thing that I find to be the most compelling update to this is now the 13 inch is, I think, once again a compelling machine because you can get a 13 inch quad core MacBook Pro now. It starts at like $1,800, but that is legit. That's I'm, I think I'm switching back to a 13-inch laptop. The XPS 13 has really convinced me that's the size. <clears throat> now i got to replace that thing because it's yeah. woefully underpowered. This app that Mike and I use to talk back and forth and I use to link up to the studio um, just consumes a ton of CPU. And so on these i5s or you know anything with two cores, it just makes the laptop spin so hard that now my fan's going out in the XPS 13, plus the side's busted. So I've got to replace this thing. And I I don't, don't know if I'm putting the MacBook Pro 13-inch in the running, but I was surprised to see this come out of nowhere right as I'm reconsidering going with a 13-inch laptop. And I think that is the most competitive update is a quad-core in a 13-inch laptop, this legit quad-core processor. Um... That's that's somewhat compelling. If I knew I could put Linux on that thing 100%, I, I think I'd, I'd, that would maybe be the machine I'd well, consider doing. Well, now let's see. Okay. 
so I agree with basically everything you said. Um, I think the the one to watch here is a 13 inch, a, a true 13 inch with a good quad core. The, I've looked at some of the benchmarks. I don't know if you did, but they're they're pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this whole T2 yeah, this is basically chip, their biggest. Uh, this is their best speed improvement since the updates they did to the MacBook Pro in 2011. Right. This is, they haven't they haven't right. uh, done an upgrade this big since then. So I agree. Like I, I have the uh, 15 inch version. I think of your Mac. Just obviously, it's 15 inches, slightly specked up. Um, and typing on it is is actually like painful. I have had to take mine in for uh, keyboard issues a number of times. Um, it, I don't know if it's because I have bad luck and maybe one of the ones I got is just more sensitive or whatever. But like it, it's it's a problem, right? I also just finally, or not finally, but for the last few months, I've had, uh, I've really finally gotten my workflow on Pop, uh, Pop OS, which is effectively Ubuntu, if you want to think about it, to be on par with Mac with the one fairly large uh, exception of iOS code signing, which is kind of more and more a rare thing for me. What's interesting to me is I never would have really seriously looked at switching my workflow to Linux had it had, I think the 2018 MacBook Pro would have been enough to stop me from looking, particularly that 13 inch model. Cause I agree with you, um, Chris, my, my primary use case for a notebook now is travel. Cause when I'm working from home, I'm using my giant Dell Optiplex and that is running pop, right? I have the Galago Pro from system 76, which is another 13 inch machine problem with that is i have the original one and the battery life is uh terrible i mean in fact i feel like it's degraded over time yeah um, it probably has i'm sure it has because ha- ha- i've had it for a while having said that the keyboard right there's a i they're playing yeah, it's, a weird better than okay, the macbook so, yep well, well no, but there's a few things here right like one i have had to take my macbook pro in for repairs i think it's actually four times now and that's kind of a lot when you use it to work right way too much right and i've only had it for like a year whenever i bought it when it was new so whatever it would must have been a year 20 uh yeah it's the late 2016 model um and i you know, it's weird right i used to live when i i used to live very relatively close like 20 minutes away from an apple store now i live further and it is a, a pretty, like, it, it was broken a few weeks ago. We talked about on the show. And instead of driving the half hour to the Apple store, I just, like, got a playing card. Uh, and I got a can of compressed air, and I just blew out the keyboard. And, and sure enough, it was, like, you know, a, a, a tiny speck of dust was in there. And just, like, my <laughs> my uh, control, or rather, command key didn't work. But Yeah, that's not, a, that's not a professional workstation. I'm just well, saying. It's also a $3,000 I mean, laptop, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just saying, like it's, you know, I just not configured. Acceptable. It's not acceptable, right? Like I configured a Dell XPS and a System seventy six Orange Pro, and they're both within the two thousand to twenty five hundred range, higher spec than my machine with more modern components, and I doubt they have this problem. So I don't know. I like, I feel weirdly conflicted. Had they, first of all, they're not saying for what appear to be legal reasons that this laptop fixes the reliability of the keyboard. And I will say my primary issue with my my Apple machine is that I've had to take it to the shop so many times, right? That, that is my number one. I mean, I don't like the touch bar, but honestly, if Chris, if I never had to take this machine in, I think I'd be relative, I'd be happy enough, right? Like it, mm. more or less, it would be a good workhorse. And I don't know, like once you go Linux, it's hard to go back. Like I, I, yeah. I look at the configurator and I say these prices are kind of ridiculous. <laughs> they're they're crazy, and they're, you know Apple's not coming out and saying we fixed it, right? Like, it, so what have you heard about? Have you used one yet? No, no, I, no, I, I haven't. Either, yeah. I have heard that uh, they, you know, they're a little squishier, same travel, a little quieter. Um, I, I my bet. If I was going to put money down on this thing, is that they've 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 fixed it to the to like the to the furthest extent they can fix it. Like it's pretty much fixed now. I bet. Um, and I I would I would think that uh, 
they'll just ride this out probably for another couple of years and then come up with a whole new keyboard model altogether. The, uh, the your point about uh, switching hardware, you know, I feel like we end up on this topic a lot on the show, and I kind of, I kind of always wonder, like, why? What is it? And it's it's been a really long process for us to figure this out, and I've been trying to trying to nail down exactly what it is. And I one of the ways I use this, the, one of the ways I think about this is I think to myself, well, what if that MacBook Pro 13 came out? And what Apple said is, hey, you know what we've realized is pro users sometimes need to run different operating systems. And what we really would like to see is an IT shop and a company that can buy all Apple hardware and you can run Windows, Linux, or, of course, Mac OS. And you're going to have the best experience on Mac OS, but we're open sourcing the SMC controller design, and, or at least we're, we're, we're publishing drivers. And what? And if that's just like just assuming that reality existed, I think I would buy that MacBook Pro. I think I would buy it. So then you just have to ask yourself: Is is my workflow on Linux worth not buying a machine over? And the answer to that for me now has become yes, simply because really? the value okay. of the workflow. The computer should serve the workflow. The workflow should not have to serve the computer in my world. Uh, I feel like that's a little reversed on mobile. And I, I've accepted that bargain on mobile because of the constraints of a small screen and battery life and limited connectivity. But when it comes to a powerful x86 based PC platform, I really feel like that is a tool that should be serving my needs, just like a tool in a shop would be serving the shopman's needs. And it'd be ridiculous that they'd change the way they work because of a certain tool. Um, and so I've I've just begun within the last couple of days kind of rethinking this a, a tad and uh i've kind of landed on on yeah I'm, i think i'm no longer in the market for these machines uh, unless i pick up video editing again which then i would be back looking at the 15 inch again i think i'm going to become an xps 13 or lenovo customer i'm not quite sure i really would like to stick with thunderbolt 3 because i think it's a great technology and Thunderbolt 3 docks are the best thing to ever happen to my workflow. I can have, I can have recording booth. I have a recording booth what right now. What dock are Texas. you using? It, that I, you're I've finding used reliable. Um, okay. I've used the Elgato one, and I've used. I think it's a Belkin one. The Belkin one, I think, was a little more expensive. I may be wrong on those. Uh, so those two are the only two I've used. And geez, man. I tell you if it's not great because for a little while I had a review Dell unit that had Thunderbolt 3, and I could use both. Uh, the, uh, actually I still have it at the studio. I have, uh, I could, I could use the Dell laptop or the MacBook pro on any of the docks and I've got, I've got, I've got a dock in the RV. I've got a dock in the studio and I've got a dock here in Texas and uh, Linux Academy picked it up for me. And so I can sit down and plug in and my laptops are all wired in. It's the same gear in all the locations. It's like, <laughs> It's like the best workflow ever, and the only thing I have to have to achieve that is Thunderbolt 3. And so I'm, that's, those are the things I'm starting to think about is 13-inch for portability and also just because if I'm not editing video, I don't need a 15-inch laptop, um, and something that has Thunderbolt. that has. And then the next things I start picking are like, well, what else would I like? I'd like a really good keyboard. I'd like a keyboard that feels pretty good. All right, I'd yeah, like, that's a, I'd like a nice feel. screen. Yeah. And those are features I much rather uh, pick a laptop on. But damn, if it's not a shit show, dude! Like I, 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 I know the people at Dell that that sell the Linux laptops. I know, I know that they sell them, and yet I have a, I, I even have a review unit from them, and yet <laughs> I cannot go to their website right now and figure out how to buy a Dell XPS 13 with Ubuntu. Like when all the SEO points you to like a, a page that says this this model is no longer available, and if you go to the main XPS page, there's no way to get to the Ubuntu version. And if you go to the developer page, it redirects you to a page that says this product is no longer available. Like I was just gonna go spec one out. I, I couldn't even figure it out. I, I I don't I don't know how to even buy one. So like it it really feels like the PC industry is such a shit show compared to Apple's process. Uh, maybe it's just dumb Chris, and I can't figure out how to work Dell's website. I've never really been able to figure no, out how to work Dell's website. No, it's not you. F finding the developer editions of the XPS is, is actually annoyingly hard. Yeah, and I just yeah. want to go spec one out and be like, mm, you know what, maybe I'll spend the last of my Bitcoin on this or something like that. That's seriously across my mind because Dell takes Bitcoin directly. 
And so, like, if, th- if there is a small possibility that they would have gotten a decent sale off of me if I could get their website working. Uh, yeah. PC shipments, by the way, are up. Um, Gardner says it's thanks to Windows 10 and the refresh cycle of people moving off of Windows 7 finally. It looks like HP and Lenovo are duking it out for the top slot. Uh, IDC is looking at the numbers for these and says that HP is ahead by about a million machines. But Gardner, looking at this, says Lenovo is ahead by 12,000 devices. So that's after taking in their acquisition of Fujitsu. Dell, Apple, and Acer are filling out the top five on both lists. Uh, Apple's up a little bit. They look like uh, looks like things are doing pretty well. Now, don't get crazy. There's little reason to really pop the champagne because they say, while this is the best news in the PC industry since 2012, <laughs> uh, that's machines were selling 87 million a quarter. Right now, they're about 25 million a quarter. So, yeah. But you know what? On the upside, that still means there's 250 million human beings buying a new computer every year. So that's not yeah. That's not that a horrible doesn't industry. sound like bad news to me. No. Um, you know, I, I do wonder if if we're being a little unfair apple oh yeah which is something i almost never wonder well like, i know i actually the, think the macbook pro be, is pr- i think this is a decent update i just i think it's i think they yeah. lost me by not staying competitive long enough and my workflow changed enough and when oh, i made yes. those changes i just made them on linux you know when i made the change and um then i'll explain why i think we're being unfair but but real quick my journey of changing to working on linux more than 50 percent of the time was actually kind of, it, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be, but there, you know, there were a few things that were real, uh, things I'd gotten used to, right? Like, uh, well, there's no doubt about it. The Mac has got some better third party applications like Alfred, airmail. Right? Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, airmail, Alfred. And my big one, honestly, we talked about him on the show. Uh, the developer's name was Capelli dash. I mean, he got thrown off the app store subsequently, but whoops. Um, it's not our fault. He, well, you got Panic's Apple. application. Yeah. Rogue Amiga uh, makes Grapple. some of the best. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah. one I still haven't replaced, right? Like, I, I no, that's still not to not... say, you know, because it's a little unfair because basically all the really great apps for Linux that, uh, that are open source are also available for the Mac. So it's not a quite like if you took all that, if you took away Inkscape and you took away Firefox and you took away that stuff, uh, then Linux would have some really great apps too. Uh, it's just that on Linux, there's no like walled garden in which you must build and how you must build everything that only runs on your platform. So we get, you know, it's basically available for everything. But you also have to admit, like, the kind of the webification of these apps has made it a lot easier than it used to be, probably. I would imagine. Right, I mean, it, it, Frank, frankly, yeah. Electron is, you know, I don't know that I would have been able to do it without Visual Studio Code or, honestly, I would use Atom if VS Code didn't exist um, or Slack being an Electron app, right? That, that might have kept me in the Mac ecosystem. But I, I do wonder if Apple had... I don't even know how to say this, but somehow come out with this MacBook instead of the 2017 version, right? If they had done the 2016 and then done the mea culpa and like, you know, put the silicon uh, uh, protection thing, which by the way, we'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, thank you, chat room, for that, about how it's pretty, according to iFixit, it's pretty clear that this is a, the silicon piece is a, fix for the issue i'm having the uh the reliability issue and that many other people are having but apple won't admit it for obvious legal reasons uh because they're being sued as chris said but like if they had come out with this as the 2017 bump and done some sort of like warranty forgiveness where like you can trade in your 2016 i feel like i likely would have traded in my 2016 bought the 2017 or 2018 or what you know what i mean and probably been happy enough right because i don't think the touch bar is enough to really annoy me i don't think USB C is really yeah. enough to w- w- the, the pain of the workflow change wouldn't have been worth it compared to that but when you have a keyboard yep. that breaks yep. on you you know yep. once every quarter it, w- it became a no-brainer that like no i gotta i gotta do something right like this is just unacceptable yeah, I think it's you, – you look at the amount of momentum that people's workflows have and how how much effort it takes to change that. There's only really a few opportunities where the stars line up. Like I was making the transition from video to audio production and I needed to relearn certain tools anyways and we had to redo the way we produce some of the shows anyways. So 
I was like, well, let's just see how far I get doing nothing but Linux and open source. And that was, that was sort of a, an opportunity that doesn't come along very often. And none of Apple's options looked very attractive at the time. But, you know, there's some, there's some really smart people here at Linux Academy. And Linux Academy has this policy is you just, you know, you pick your rig as long as you can get your work done. And so it's, it's, it's mostly like mostly Linux and Macs um, with a one or two Windows systems. It's predominantly a lot of GNOME. Uh, I didn't. I don't think I've seen any plasma desktop here, and then um, and then Max, and um, a lot of them haven't really had this problem because they're they're not they weren't they weren't in a workflow that was getting disrupted by these issues, and um, the corporate refresh cycle is such that they've sort of just averaged out the inactivity in the line. See where. In in the video profession, you're constantly soaking as much performance out of your machine as possible. That's why they just started selling a seven hundred dollar eGPU from Blackmagic. Like you're constantly trying to soak the power out of that machine, and every little thing. That's why they're trying to get to such fast SSDs is because that speeds up renders and imports, just like it speeds up builds and all that. And so that was something that's always on my radar. And it's it's got it's a it's um. Whatever, whatever machine I end up with, it needs to have a reliable update cadence because of that requirement. Yes. Even when I'm doing audio, you know, it still needs to have a reliable update cadence. But that's not true for everyone. So not everyone has that cadence at that pace. And not everyone had their workflow all that disrupted, at least not proportionally to the amount of disruption it has to change to a whole different OS. So I think, I think except for those of us on the edge, I think they nailed this in time. Well, I won't say nailed it, but I think they got there. I think they got there in time to prevent the majority of the bleeding. No, I think you're right. Right. I, I think the reality is there was there was some percentage of the 2016 and, and by some extension 2017 MacBook Pro keyboards that are like mine, just like they break once a quarter and, you know, it sucks to be you, bro. But like, that's not the majority, right? If it were the majority, it would be more of a more of a scandal than than it is. I should I should do a little informal like asking around here for the folks that have the that trick keyboard and see how what kind of problems they've had. Right, but I do wonder now. Cause, you know, we we've been covering, and I know people hate these episodes, but you know, it's actually in the news. Uh, you know, this quote unquote Mac Exodus. I I sort of feel like this 2018 MacBook Pro, and I think it, unfortunately is going to blunt that. Yeah, and you also have the iMac Pro, which I think uh, is a pretty solid performing machine, especially right now, you know, while it's still kind of new. Uh, and then it looks like uh, Mojave <clears throat> is going to be a decent update to the Mac platform. This is exactly, exactly what I predicted. This is 100% to the date what I predicted at the beginning of the year whenever we did our predictions. I said that Apple would start slowly turning the ship. It would just take them a long time, and they would start with the iMac and the, and the MacBooks, and that's exactly what they've just done. And just like uh, Windows 10 turned that Vista ship and, the, and that Windows 8 momentum, Windows 10, like we just said, is is seeing a decent refresh cycle right now. The commercial vendors are slow to respond, but they do usually, if their pocketbooks depend on it, start to figure it out, especially some of the, uh, the more um, aggressive yeah. companies. Now... I don't think that means other solutions are left on the on the wayside. It's sort of like uh, it's sort of like the politics here in the states, like how we swing so hard from left to right all the time. So it's you know just it's this constant whiplash of of politics in our country. Uh, I think the commercial vendors do that with their attention to their to their rather boring desktop operating systems. They swing in and they get all really fired up and get some work done, and then they swing out. Whereas the Linux and open source desktops just slowly but surely continue to improve over time at one continuous cadence, which is more predictable in a way. And I find it, again, to be, at least for my workflow, um, a little more peace of mind. And like I follow some of the projects that I use a lot now, I follow very closely, like the Plasma desktop. Those guys are cranking out, and gals obviously, are cranking out incredible work on a weekly basis. And it's nothing like, it's not like uh, one day there's just uh, this whole new feature, although sometimes there is that. Uh, it's just like, you know, we fix this thing, we fix that thing, and it's just this continuous improvement cycle. Um, and that's where I feel like Windows and Mac will suffer long term, but I'm not surprised to see Apple pull this around. And especially, um, especially when uh, there's a developer market for them to really solidly lock down, they'd be negligent. 
So I wonder, though, if if Apple can reclaim their dominance in non-window developer machines, what will that mean to applications that right now are being like written in Electron and things like that to be cross-platform and also run on Linux? You still got web browsers in Chrome OS. You still got the Windows Mac uh, paradigm. And this, th- there was an exodus to Linux. Like um, <clears throat> I've never in my life seen so many people running desktop Linux anymore. And I've... You know, I used to try to get people to switch like crazy. They used to be, I used to be like an evangelist for the platform, and now I'm more like an advocate. Like I, I totally support people running whatever they want. But if you want help running Linux, you know, I'm going to be there to help you and, and make suggestions. But I'm not going to try to convert you. Um, and so now that I have more of like a pacifist uh, approach to it, 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 I'm seeing more people than ever run Linux. So there is always going to be like Slack users on Linux, I believe. I think that's always, uh, 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 at least as long as Linux is relevant in the cloud, it's always going to be relevant now on the desktop. And so this Apple's Apple taking their foot off the gas and Microsoft screwing up Vista and Windows 8 um, were great for Linux. And I think it the door is permanently cracked open now. And I think that crack is just going to grow over time. Well, and the rela- reality that uh, if you're, you know, m- most software is now running in the cloud, right? Uh, new development, yeah. I mean. So you're probably you're probably going to be targeting some form of Linux or Unix-like operating system for your actual deployment platform, I would think. I mean, for me, that's certainly yeah. the case. It's all Ubuntu. Yeah, but. yeah, exactly. And that's that's great before because that means you're still going to want to they're still going to have to publish those applications for the Linux desktop. Uh, real quick, I, I've mentioned them a few times. Linux Academy, LinuxAcademy.com/coders is where you go to sign up for a free seven day trial and support the show. It's an advanced platform to learn all about Linux, and man, are they working on advancing it? I've I've seen some things, and they have hands on scenario based labs that give you real experience, actual hands on experience with the technology you're learning. Self paced in depth video courses on every cloud Linux and DevOps topic. In fact, really just think about it this way. If it runs Linux or Linux runs on it, they have courseware on it. If Python is on your list, they've got courseware on that. iOS and Android apps, study tools like Lesson Audio and personal notebooks that you can download and keep offline. And they have a great community stacked full of Jupyter Broadcasting members. This is a great month to sign up to because July is nuts. They've already launched over 70, 75 new bits of content like learning activities and challenges and courses. And they have more coming up. That's one of the reasons I'm down here is to help them out with these live streams. All powered by Linux, 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 Linux. And uh, they're, not, they're just launching tons of stuff like AWS content, Red Hat cert- certifications, security courseware on Linux. It's just getting really good. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. That's got an S. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Support the show and sign up for a free seven-day trial. Uh, do you want to mention this Instapaper story at all before we get out of here? It's kind of huge news. Instapaper is going independent again. If you recall, yeah. Marco sold yeah. it to Betaworks in 2013, yep. Yep. and then Betaworks sold it to, yeah, Pinterest. And then yep. what? Yeah, Pinterest. Right. They sold it to then the Betaworks sold it to Pinterest, and now the folks that have been working on it under that leadership are spinning off onto their own independent team. That's huge. Yeah, I think the real story here, though, is uh, they they've had a whole pile of trouble since GDRP. Is that what this is? I I, I oh you haven't that. you haven't heard any of this? Oh dude, you're you're yeah. out of the out of the loop here. Yeah, I haven't uh, followed so it very when, much. So no. when for two months now, or maybe a month and a half, I, I forgot the exact date for GDRP in the EU because I don't have yeah, you yeah. Know, commercial apps anymore. Um, when yeah, they they had to shut off the service for their European customers. I so if I you saw are comments, EU, like it redirects you to like a GDPR page or something, right? There's, there's just an HTML page that says like you're. Sorry, basically, right? We can't comply with the GDPR. GDPR right hard, now. yeah. yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah I, I imagine that Pinterest didn't want to make the investment. Whatever, I don't know, right? This is all. Th- this product has. It, it's a little weird to me, right? Because it was yeah. obviously making a living for Marco. Uh, Marco is, of course, Marco Armit. He sold it to BetaWorks, which I'm I'm very familiar with BetaWorks. When I used to live up north. Uh, they're like they're a very interesting shop. When you drop your pen on your mic, they buy basically individual. De- well, this is a thing they do: products from individual developers that show promise or have made money, and they try to work with them from there. Then they sold it to Pinterest, which presumably that's what BetaWorks wants to do, right? Like they they buy your product and then they sell it to a bigger company. Oh, well, you could kind of say, oh yeah, there's some there's some synergies between Pinterest and Instapaper. 
No, it makes a ton of sense. I'm not, this is, none of this is criticism, right? Um, and if you're not familiar, maybe we should say what Instapaper is, right? So it's a, it's a save your article to read later, later. If you use Firefox, you probably see Pocket, because I think Mozilla now owns Pocket, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, same idea. Pinterest um, actually rewrote Instapaper from scratch. So it's a little weird that it's now going to an independent company, but but according to the blog post, it's going to be the same personnel working on the app. Yeah. And you know who really won here? Marco. <laughs> I just want to throw that yeah, out. Right? There. No, right. Like, yeah, right. I'm kidding. Yeah. It 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 it's tough because Instapaper used to charge, and then Pinterest made it free free actually completely free. I so what I is mean, the monetization is, here? How right, do they this make is going to go back to Code Radio circa 2013 here, but. How the hell do you tell your couple million customers that, hey, now you have to pay me? That doesn't seem like a conversation I want to have, especially with Pocket. It does have a premium mode, but it's effectively free. Um, I mean, I have premium, but I read. In fact, they sent me a creepy message at the end of the year that I was like in the top like 1% of readers or something, which means huh. I'm on my iPad too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. I don't know. I mean, is it? Doesn't this feel like I'm gonna get in trouble? You should stop me. But an app from the golden age of the App Store dying a very slow, very painful death. Like this doesn't sound like good news. Is this good news? Am I just complete like with the GDRP problem? Plus, like I don't know. It feels like Pinterest is kind of kicking them out out the house, right? Yeah, I don't know if we know yet if it's good news. We don't know um, what the deal is, right? No one's really leaked anything, but it, it it feels bad to me. You probably have a different take. No, it feels like it feels like um, it feels like a, a, a separation out of necessity. Uh, I.e., like you know, I think we've come to a decision that this is no longer going to be a priority for us here at Pinterest. And uh, thank you so much for everything you've done, but uh, you know, we're going to have to move on and do something else. And then maybe the conversation goes, well, what if you give us a nice severance and we just kick off and do this ourselves for a while? Who knows? Maybe that's what happened here. Um, I like Instapaper. I, I've always liked it. So it's too bad I've moved over to Pocket now that I'm a Firefox user. So yeah. it's harder when it's baked into the browser, that's for sure. And it's I'm kind of surprised that nobody's figured out how to monetize all of that juicy data you would get out of Instapaper. You'd see what everybody's reading. You'd see what everybody's bookmarking. That's well, it's like those that damn hippies in Brussels that screwed it all up, right? That's oh, true. Whoop. That is apparently did throw a wrench into things. Uh, fascinating, though, and I do wish them the luck. It uh, all of them's the lucks. Uh, it kind of reminds me how uh, Susa keeps getting passed around, and then it gets every time it gets it gets sort of positioned as like this great new partnership that's going to help us I do more succeed. Used to love Sousa Studio, man. Like Sousa, <laughs> yeah. Have a mighty, no longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Dominic, is there say, anything else? Oh no, yeah. Uh, well, I just if I could steal you for another minute. Yeah, go ahead. I feel like Instapaper is getting a lot of press, but I think there's a lot of stories about apps from the let's say 2009 to the 2012 era that are really hitting hard times. Mm, I think that's a fair observation. Yeah. And that's it. Where I want to point you to is at Doom Nuke on Twitter. <laughs> huh. I leave everybody with that little bit of wisdom. Hmm. I wonder how that old Texas Hold'em game is doing. Well, Mr. Dominic, I agree. Go follow him on Twitter. I'm at Chris LAS. The whole dang network is at Jupiter Signal. And of course, you can catch Coda Radio live on Mondays almost all the time. We have that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and the live streams at jblive.tv. Thanks so much for joining us. If you want to give us some feedback, coder.show slash contact and links for everything we talked about at coder.show slash 318. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you right back here next week. See you later.